In 1830, with the very enthusiastic support of President Andrew Jackson, Congress passed the Removal Act, the Removal Act, which in essence authorized the President of the United States to negotiate with American Indians living east of the Mississippi so that they would move west of the Mississippi. And the deal was this, here was the deal. The U.S. government would pay for American Indians to make the journey west, outfit them, give them animals and other things, and then would pay for their first year of residence in their new home, would give them land in return for the land they were leaving, and would then protect them, so federal protection, including federal military protection, in perpetuity, forever. So that was the deal. And thousands of American Indians, tens of thousands, actually took the deal more or less voluntarily. You could put air quotes around voluntarily simply because, of course, there is pressure here. But in any case, without being forced under you know, armed guard or whatever, uh, a lot of American Indians actually took the deal. And Andrew Jackson, over the course of his presidency, he'll end up signing something like 70 separate treaties with various American Indian groups and peoples and nations and tribes. And something like 50,000 American Indians who are originally from east of the Mississippi, mostly from the south, we're talking mostly here about the south, uh, will end up moving during his presidency west, west of the Mississippi, mostly to Oklahoma. However, there are those who are recalcitrant. There are those who, you know, they want to stay. They, they refuse to move. And they're given a little bit of time, but when they don't go, often the government will show up, gather them up, essentially turn them into prisoners, and force them to move. Of course, the most famous episode here, known as the Trail of Tears, has to do with the Cherokee, a group of about 15,000 Cherokee who had refused to move were then forced to move, um, and it was terrible. I mean, conditions were bad uh, of the 15,000, something like one in five, perhaps as many as one in three, died along the way. And then what these American Indians often found when they got to this land that had been set aside for them in Oklahoma or elsewhere was that it was not good land. I mean, they, they just traded away 100, 150,000 square miles of fertile land, of cultivated land, for 30, 40,000 square miles of uncultivated prairie, not nearly as fertile. And when they got there, they often found themselves in the crosshairs of other American Indians, in particular the Comanche and various other Plains Indians. You know, these are, the newcomers are vulnerable. Uh, they're not in a good state. And so they're ripe for, for raids, to become victims of raids. And, and indeed, they were consistently victimized in this way. So, pretty miserable, certainly a stain in the history of the United States government, no question about it. Uh, I'm standing here at a monument dedicated to the Creek Trail of Tears, dedicated to the Creek in general. This is all Creek territory, and when we use the term Trail of Tears, we're usually referring to the Cherokee, but it's also been referred now to the experiences of any American Indian group that was forcibly removed from their homeland, and those that did not agree to go voluntarily, uh, often forcibly removed and sent west. So this was the site, just a little bit through these trees here, there was a fort built during the War of 1812 called Fort Mitchell. And it was sort of like a, a creek collection center. I mean, the, the creek were gathered from the villages along the Chattahoochee River, which is just through these trees right here, and gathered together, often put in chains, here in Fort Mitchell, and then from here they'd be shipped up to Montgomery and then get on a steamboat down the Mississippi to Mobile, and then they'd be shipped to, you know, to Oklahoma or wherever. And by the time the federal government was done, we're talking by 1840, certainly by the mid to late 1850s, there are almost no American Indians left east of the Mississippi. The vast majority of them have either moved, having taken the government up on its deal, or have been forcibly removed by the U.S. government. Uh, only small, small pockets of the original inhabitants of this land are left east of the Mississippi. Why did Indian removal 
happen in the first place? What were the motivations? Well, it's hard to say that the number one motivation wasn't land. Uh, you know, white settlers, uh, that area of white settlement was expanding rapidly. You have white settlers showing up and making deals with the American Indians on their own, purchasing land, squatting on their land illegally. It seemed it was very difficult for the government to regulate this sort of thing. Uh, you had speculators, land speculators, showing up and wheeling and dealing, which they were very good at with the various American Indian groups. And often, at the end of the day, the American Indians felt swindled by the deal that, that resulted. So a lot of bitter feelings being produced here. You know, land, definitely a motivation. There were other motivations too. When valuable resources were discovered on Indian lands, well, suddenly people would covet them. Gold was discovered, for example, on Indian lands in the South. Andrew Jackson is often seen as the face of American Indian removal. So we can look to him for some reasons, from justifications. I mean, how do you justify this sort of thing? Well, these days, Andrew Jackson is often portrayed almost in comic book fashion, like a comic book style villain or something. Very shallow analysis, in my opinion. Uh, he was actually a very complicated guy, and he had a very complicated relationship with American Indians. Uh, he fought against them, of course, quite brutally. He gained a reputation for, for being ruthless. In the Creek War, and he fought against the Seminole as well. Um, but at the same time, he fought with them. When he was fighting the Creeks, he was allied with the Cherokee and the Choctaw, and he fought alongside them by the hundreds, by the thousands. And he had great respect for them as warriors. When he fought against the Seminole, he fought in alliance with the Creek, and side by side with the Creek. When he successfully defended New Orleans against the British, he was fighting with American Indians. So he had a, a respect, a great respect for American Indians, uh, at least as warriors, and at least according to him, wanted to see them and their civilization preserved. See, we can look for his motivations, can't get into his head, but we can look at the documents left behind. Uh, one of those documents, an 1835 message to Congress by Andrew Jackson, reveals a few things, maybe provides a little bit of critical nuance here. Uh, first of all, he seems to see Amer various American Indian groups and the United States as representing two different civilizations. Not just different, but incompatible. In the sense that if they are together too long, there will be conflict and eventually one of them will destroy the other or one of them will simply disappear over time. So that's what he meant by incompatible. And of course, given the numbers of Americans, European Americans, versus those of the natives, uh, the, the civilization that would be expected to disappear would be that of the natives. And he could look to the north and the northeast. You know, where were those American Indians? Well, they were largely gone. In fact, he would point this out to his northern critics who would criticize his removal policies and whatnot. He would say, you hypocrites. I mean, look around you. Where are your American Indians? They're all gone. And the same fate likely awaits those American Indian groups living in the south unless we do something about it and his solution was to remove them. He blamed close proximity with whites. In fact, he pre presented himself as being very concerned about alcoholism, which was rampant among American Indians. Once again, he blamed close proximity with whites. So these people, for their own good, for their, the survival of their civilization, must be removed from whites, must be removed from white civilization, and therefore west of the Mississippi, and then protected in this new territory from white settlement and at that, that close proximity. So that's maybe a little bit of nuance there to add to the sort of comic book portrayals. This in no way, of course, justifies his actions, his, the policies that he supported, the, the brutal removal uh, carried out by the U.S. military. Of course, I'm in no way justifying any of that, simply adding some context and some, some nuance some complexity. History is muddy. Thank you so much for watching to the end. 
I really appreciate that. If you want me to keep creating content like this, consider becoming my patron over on patreon.com. Also follow me on Instagram where weekly I issue updates as well as a set of history challenges, a little more engagement there. It's a lot of fun. We'll see you there.